Hello there, my name is Brandon, and in this three-part series, we'll be creating a 3D model within Clip Studio Paint, and then using that model as the basis for an illustration. In my case, this is going to become a pixel art piece because that's what I like to do, but a lot of the underlying workflow can be applied to other approaches as well. In this first video, we're going to cover the basics of 3D modeling within Clip Studio Paint, and then I'll show you how I put together this custom motorcycle model to use for my drawing. So let's get to it. And yeah, in case you haven't seen, Clip Studio Paint is actually capable of 3D modeling. And in one of the recent updates, they've added a set of primitive shapes that can be used to build up your own creations. To access these 3D primitives, you can look here for the Material window, or alternatively, you can go up to Window, Material, and then select Primitive. Along the side here, you'll see these fundamental primitives, and there's five of them total. And there's also one called Billboard, um, which is more of a unique display item, and we're gonna talk about that one toward the end of the video. For now, let's consider how to work with the basic primitives. We can add one of these to the workspace by dragging it onto our canvas, and you'll see that it's now created a 3D area where we can manipulate the object. And there's also a set of camera and position controls. The first three let you rotate, pan, and zoom the camera for the scene. And the next set are various controls to move the object around within that space, including rotations along different axes. My preferred method for manipulating the object though is to actually just click on it and then we'll see this new overlay which arranges those same functions into these anchors that you can use to click and drag around. So for example, if I want to move the object along any of those three axes, I can hover my mouse on that set of arrows and then click and hold while moving it along. And clicking on that circle at the center of these axes will give free movement. Similarly, we can rotate the object by clicking and dragging on one of those rotational arcs. These square tabs along the outside will let us resize our object in that direction. And again, we just click and drag to change the object dimensions along any side of it with these tabs. And if you need to resize the entire object uniformly, you can use that gray ring along the outside to do that. Also, you may have noticed that all the motions using these controls have been fairly smooth and continuous. But if you prefer to constrain them to a limited set of positions, which is sometimes useful when doing careful assembly and alignment, you can click on this magnet icon here to snap them into position. So with that activated, rotations will now snap to preset positions on this dial, and this makes it way easier to plan out exact rotations. We can also make use of snapping when we have multiple objects in the workspace, because we'll get these guides that show up to help us snap them into an aligned position or sizing. So that's essentially the crash course in manipulating 3D primitives and now I'm going to put together my own custom motorcycle object assembled from these basic shapes. As I mentioned, this is going to end up being used for pixel art illustration, so I'm going to use a canvas size of 500 by 300 pixels. And what's nice about the 3D modeling is that it'll actually render at a higher resolution while we're working on it, and then eventually when we're finished we can view this at the lower pixel art resolution. So to get this started, I've dropped in a sphere and then compressed it inward to use as a tire. After placing it somewhere nice on the grid, I copy and paste it in place and then move that copy away for the second tire. I'm going to use a prism for part of the body of the motorcycle, and this was mainly because it looked like the angles would help out for providing an interesting shape for the model. Um, from here, I kept adding different sizes of cubes and prisms uh, that are kind of chained along to continue building up the body. And for this, I found it really useful to enable the snapping feature because it was important that these pieces were aligned with each other uh, so they actually form kind of a nice center to the motorcycle. So a lot of the resizing and rotations here are using those snap positions to fit things together nicely. At the front of the bike, I've used a prism for each of the handlebars and I took one of the pyramid shapes and then kind of rotated it and like stuck it in the front to work as a makeshift headlight. Um, then I've added a plane to use as a small windshield. It looks kind of funny on the model for now, uh, but it'll end up being useful just as sort of this point of reference for that piece, even if it is a bit simple. At this point, I wanted to refine the position of the entire front end of the bike. And if you want to grab multiple objects at once, you can click on Window and then Subtool Detail. From here, you'll see something called the Object List, and it's got every primitive that we've added so far. And from here, you can toggle their visibility just like layers. The other thing we can do is control or command click on multiple objects, and then we'll be able to move all these pieces at once. 
What's interesting is that if your objects share a common point of rotation, you can even select multiple layers and rotate them together. Um, in this case, I had copy pasted a series of prisms to create this bar that's going along the back of the bike. And selecting these pieces together allowed me to adjust the angle of that all in one movement. Another cool trick with copy pasting objects in place is when we create pieces that share the exact same center, um, but then resize them to different sizes. So what I mean is like right here, I've copied this handlebar in place and now I'm resizing it evenly using that outer ring on the overlay. Now when I pinch it in from that side closest to us using the tab, um, you can see that it's creating this perfect sleeve over the original piece. And it almost has this look like it's been machined out using a lathe. So here's a look at the mostly finalized model. You can see that I've added a deformed sphere into the main body just to build up that form a little bit more. And there's also a lot of cubes that have been stretched out to create the impression of a seat as well as this control dashboard up front. And from here, there are a few presentational things that we can do if we want to get a bit fancy with the modeling. Um, first of all, we can change the color of these objects. I actually think the default gray looks pretty cool too, but if we want to change this, we'll first click on an object and then go over to where it says color. Right here, we see where the gray is being assigned. So if we open that, we can select the new color and it'll make the replacement on the object. If you want to recolor multiple pieces at once, again, we can go into the object list and select those pieces and then select the color to be replaced for that entire selection. Using this approach, I've gone through to add a small handful of colors into the model. And this really helped to distinguish pieces that I imagine being metallic from those that are more um, polished or like finished parts of the body itself. One thing that's important to mention with the color is that we can also get rid of that mesh texture if you'd prefer just sort of a cleaner look. And for that, you simply toggle the box that's labeled show wireframe. I'm actually going to leave these on though, because I think it'll eventually help for the drawing side of things, um, just to provide some additional point of reference in the shapes. One of the final color related items we can toggle is the transparency. So if we expand that color box, you'll see this option for alpha, which is set to opaque by default. But if we change that to semi-transparent, it'll allow you to scale the transparency just like you might be familiar with for regular illustration layers. And so here I was just having a bit of fun uh, using this for the windshield just to make it so you could actually kind of see through that piece there. One of the things that's noticeable with the final model here is that it's really only lit from one side. Um, the right half of it is almost completely dark. Now I was planning to view this from the left anyway, but if we want to play with the lighting, uh, you'll see that these default lights appear in the object list as well. And in this case, we'll see that parallel light two is actually disabled. So I've decided to turn that one on. And then by using this sphere diagram to place the direction of the light source, we're now able to light the other side of the model as well. Another fun effect is that you can change the color of the light uh, from this box here. And doing this in combination with having color a model itself can provide more complex or atmospheric looks. And now if we really wanted, we could sort of finish this out by establishing a bit of extra scenery or context for the model. And we can do that pretty efficiently by mapping backdrop images onto planes. So what I'm doing here is dropping in a plane object and rotating it down to think of as being the ground below the model. Now if we go over to the color options, um, we can either click on file if you've got your own image that you'd like to select, or we can click on materials, which pulls from the Clip Studio library of assets that you have saved. From the assets page, I'd grabbed these textures earlier. Um, there's this stone pattern and then a few different sky designs. So if we go ahead and select the stone pattern, it's going to assign that onto the plane. And then after resizing that to fill the frame, we've got a really quick design for the ground. Similarly, I'll drop in a plane to use for the sky and then assign it using one of my options from the available materials here. So with just those two planes, we've already got the makings of a small scene here. Um, the last thing we'll add are those billboard objects. So my default billboard here has this tree artwork assigned to it, and I'll drop that in and resize it into the scene. And billboards work pretty much like a plane object does, uh, except when you rotate the camera, you'll notice that the artwork stays facing you rather than skewing off like a sheet of paper. And this is because of the setting called Rotate and Follow Camera, which is enabled by default here. So this works nicely um, for certain contextual elements like this to ensure that the artwork doesn't get distorted 
and just that it's always facing the camera no matter where you're positioned. So in this case, it seems like a good way to handle the trees within the scene. Now this is going to become a 2D illustration, so the final task here is going to be to frame out a nice static angle on the model uh, to become the basis for the drawing. Along with the camera controls that we've already looked at, there's also a meter to control the amount of perspective warp, um, which has the effect of exaggerating the foreshortening of the 3D scene. And you can get pretty extreme with that one if you want to. If we look at just the bike by itself, uh, you can see how you'd be able to frame out different angles and different dynamics of that finalized model um, using just the camera angle and perspective. In this same panel, there's also some controls to fine tune the camera position, um, like giving it a roll or simply making minor adjustments to the XYZ positions too. So I've gone ahead and selected this angle on the bike to move forward with. And in the next video, we're gonna take this image and then create some pixel art line work over top, while also expanding some of that simple modeling into solidified design ideas with more character to them. So thanks for joining me on this, and I hope to see you in the next one.